We have the pleasure, a double pleasure today, to welcome uh, Ontario Burton, who is an app developer, game and app developer for iPad, iPhone, iPod Touch, Apple platform, as well as others. And at the same time, launching our own students' Apple users group. So I'm very uh, delighted that you're all here. Um, Ontario and I met very recently, so our relationship is very recent, but very uh, fruitful and very strong. Um, he is from FMC, Future Media Concepts, where I took an app development course with him, uh, brushed up on some of my programming skills, and he's super. And um, he's showed me some wonderful things, and I thought that would be wonderful to share with everybody here. So without much else to say, I hand it over. Ontario. Thanks. Thanks, Esther. So, just so I know who I'm talking to, um, who's, a, who's a programmer in this room? Who's, who's maybe had a class? Um, yeah, okay. So, like one hand for programmers, but like ten hands for classes. So, it doesn't matter if you got a C or I just, I'm just wondering who has some experience. Who, um, uh, and, and who has any interest in iPhone development? Or thinks it's cool, right? Okay. So, um, uh, so my goal here today, Esther invited me to come in and give you a little, a little peek into uh, what uh, video game development looks like. And I've been a game developer full time for five or six years. Um, a lot on the PC, a little bit on console, but for the last two and a half years, strictly iPhone and um, iPad ever since the first one came out. Um, <clears throat> so. I want to give you a look at what I do day in and day out, what I love to do, what makes me most excited, and that's just how to get a good iPhone app uh, built off the ground um, and have a chance at being successful. So if you were to start writing an app today or, um, or if you just finished one and you want to put some polish on it, I'm going to tell you what goes into giving you your best chance of success that you could you know, start using today. So I'm going to talk to you about fun, about proper execution, uh, about marketing, about polish, and those are the four, those are really the four pillars that hold up a good app. And then after that, um, I want to talk to you about passion and about uh, getting some good naysayers on your side, which is important. So to start off about fun, uh, three years ago I went to San Francisco, went to my second game developers conference. And one of my favorite sessions was uh, a breakout session on fun, where someone did a research-driven dissection of what fun actually is. And if you're going to make a game for somebody, you better know what they're going to enjoy. Um, I hadn't considered it before this conference, but there are actually different kinds of fun, and you have to know what you're going for if you're going to be successful. Um, there's the kind of fun where you have these brief little Casual games are like this. You have these brief little um, challenges to overcome and then, uh, and then a, an immediate reward. And it's just something easy to unwind with at the end of a long day. Um, that's a successive, uh, a successive set of peaks and valleys of stress and release. Uh, if anyone's played Angry Birds, who's, who's seen that game? Yeah? Or uh, Tiny Wings? Right? That's more recent, fine. But both of them, you have a, a little quick, easy input that you immediately get some good or bad feedback, right? There's also much longer games. Who in here has ever played StarCraft? All right, those are the, those are the five really cool kids in my book, right? <laughs> um, so StarCraft is a real-time strategy game where you're building up all your buildings and your armies, and as long as the other guy doesn't rush you or vice versa, you're playing for an hour to totally crush him and get your strategy of your hundred guys to properly overcome him and his, his 70 guys, right? Because you're faster than him. So when you're, uh, that kind of game is a much different kind of fun. It's a constant uh, slope of stress. It requires a lot more thinking and strategy. So you gotta know exactly what you're making and what your customer wants. Turns out that the casual games are tons of fun and sell really well on the iPhone, the first kind of fun. And there's other kinds too. There's like four different categories. But um, does, it, ha, does anybody know what the recent, uh, I don't know if you know, but the, the recent um, StarCraft rip, rip off on iPhone is? I, I want to know if these five cool kids 
uh, know what it is. So um, Gameloft came out with a game called um, Starfront, and it's an exact copy of StarCraft. It has the same three races. It even has like the same lighting. The Marine's face is blue on this side, red on the other from the lighting. Everything's just a complete copy. But it didn't do very well. And uh, they, they recently dropped it to 99 cents, and it's only at like number 15 in the rankings, which we'll look at here in a sec. Um, so you got to know what's fun for the platform and the people you're making the game for. Um, so then proper execution. Um, <clears throat> who, can tell me, uh, who can tell me what tools you start with to make an iPhone app? Who's familiar a little bit? Xcode. Yeah, you need Xcode. That's the, that's the compiler. That's the, that's the program that you write your code into that compiles it into machine code and deploys it onto your app. Um, now, Xcode in and of itself is, you know, a little bit dry. You need to, you need to get to know it and get very proficient in, with, in it throughout your, your duration of app creation. But you're going to be using other tools, uh, especially to make games. You might use some animation libraries, core animation that Apple gives you. And if you look up a core animation um, tutorial, uh, you can be a whiz at that and have some really good looking, a good looking app in just an hour or two. Um, so don't be afraid of core animation if you uh, run up against that. But you might also use a game engine like I do, and I'll show you on here. Um, there's all different kinds of game engines. Uh, my favorite is Unity, and I'll show you around here a little bit what a game engine does for you. And I have to resize it to fit on the, the projector automatically resizes everything to like 20 pixels by 20 pixels. So we've got to shrink it down a little bit. All right, so this is, uh, this is a game engine. And if you don't use a game engine to make your game, then you might be a big enough company that you wrote your own. Um, but you're going to end up making some kind of framework that your game runs off of, because you're going to end up with physics, collisions. Uh, for sure, you're going to have texturing and rendering. Uh, so you have to consider if it's worth it to you to buy one of these anyway. I use Unity, which is free, uh, from a company in Europe. And it's 200 bucks to get the iPhone version. So I can build anything in here, push it out to my devices. So I'll show you what's in a game editor. You have a bunch of assets over here that you've dragged in. You have scripts you've written. This one lets you do it in JavaScript. So if you've done any web programming, um, you can pretty easily get into to Unity 3D. You also drag in your textures, your 3D models. And you take these assets and you drag them into this 3D world space up here in the upper left. And you can see here that I've got this, uh, this little alien guy on the dance floor. So you can already tell this is going to be a great game, right? It's going to be super. So this guy's on the dance floor. Um, I've, put a, uh, I've put a second alien underneath because it's kind of expensive to do reflection shaders on the iPhone. So the cheap way is you just take whatever you want reflected, stick it underneath, and make sure the ground in between is a little bit uh, trans transparent. And you know, this is what it looks like down here. This is the camera view of what it's going to look like. So um, this couldn't be easier to use. I can grab my models, and over here I can affect every different attribute about them possible. And you know, I think this is playable. So my little guy is my little guy is down here. I already, I already lost. All right. So then down here you can actually play the game and. See what it's like. I can't do it on the track thing at the same time. Um, but you're probably going to want to use a game engine or some comparable tools. You've got to find the, the subset of tools you need to make your game, though. Um, you also got to know what the path of least resistance is between you and making your idea happen. So you want to know where some, some free art assets and, and sound are online. Obviously, you've got to have art in your game to make it look good. Um, but you have to have audio. I've seen game ideas completely die, because no matter how good they were, they didn't put in any audio. And that's going to take a day of your time or more to find the right audio, to get it sounding good, to get it mixed well. Um, so in Angry Birds, you got this little slingshot guy, and, and, you, and you throw him. I was teaching a class, and they, they asked to be able to make Angry Birds. And we were able to mock up those physics in the game engine. It took me like two hours or less to get a prototype of Angry Birds working, because you already have in a game engine the physics and the collisions and the other things I mentioned. Um, 
But something that Angry Birds has that they do really well is they have a lot of polish. One of them is the audio, like when your little birds fly, they, um, they squawk and, and, and they have happy squawks when, when they knock something over and they have these, these sad squawks when you miss completely. And it gives you a little bit of uh, emotional feedback um, right away. And that's some of the polish we need. You also, before we leave execution, you also need uh, to know where to get, to get art. Some of my favorite places are um, these free photo brushes sites. If you typed in free photo brushes, you'd end up at myphotobrushes.com. But they have all, you can, they have sci-fi, nature, girly, matcha, whatever you want, but you can make a scene like this with these little, they're, they're called brushes, but they're really just stencils that you can use in your drawing program, because you will, as a game developer, be at least familiar with GIMP, which is free, or Pixelmator, which is like 30 bucks on the Mac, or Photoshop, um, if, you, if you have that or put out the money for that. But you can use these in there to, uh, to make a pretty, a pretty cute game with some free art. Um, but you know, nothing's really, really free. Uh, let's look at how these mechs are made. So my favorite place to go for game art is 3drt.com. And I just want to get you familiar with the, the idea that you've got to have a lot, of, a lot of places you go for quality assets or your game is sunk. A really fun game that, that isn't polished, that looks terrible, won't get picked up. Because do you know how people buy apps in the App Store? We can look right here. You go in, you go to the iTunes Store, you click on the App Store. And over here on the right, you'll see this list of top 10 apps. That's what everybody sees first and looks at first. This will come in in marketing. And then you also have, um, um, when you go into an app, you have the screenshots of what that app is. Hopefully this is some nice game and not some offensive something. Good, it's Catan. So you come into here and you see these screenshots. People um, make their judgment about if they're going to buy your app or not by how it looks in these screenshots. So you have to not only have your game look good, but you better have five screenshots that look sick and have enough difference from each other that it looks like a beautiful game with some variety in it. I actually do that from the get-go. I say, okay, I have this game in mind. Do I have enough gameplay that I can show five beautiful screenshots? Because this sells you or not. This is your entire face on the App Store. Um, so when you go into there, let me show you some nice art. And this is going to kind of show the process. So um, when an artist makes the art for your game, because some of you might be interested in the art side, they have to make a 3D mesh model in a, game, in, in a program like Maya or 3D Studio Max. And then it has, to be, um, it has to be properly textured so it can be lit. And this is some nice, some nice light mapping that they're putting on. If you can see it, I can zoom in actually. Um, they put on some really nice light mapping and you can see a bunch of detail here that wasn't part of the mesh. The mesh was very simple and lightweight and then these are all put on with uh, shaders. But then of course you have to get it um, colored with a nice texture. You can add its own self-illumining light. Welcome anyone who's just coming in. And, uh, and then they have to be animated. So these things aren't any good unless they can run around and and shoot each other. Uh, I don't ever make violent games, so for me they're shooting each other with water cannons or something, you know? Make the other guy rust to death. The game takes like 10 years, right? So, but I love these things. I'm gonna find a game for them. I actually wanted these to be in my dancing game, because these look so tough. You expect some big Rambo game, but then they like do some disco dancing, right? That could be a lot of fun. That kind of thing is great on the iPhone. So the thing is, you gotta, so the reason why I love this art is because it already comes textured and animated, and it's 191 bucks for these five mechs, and then you get their, you get their uh, skins, their textures, so that you can completely change them any which way you want. So you gotta go out and find the places where you're gonna find, where you're gonna get the best bang for your buck. If you have no money in your pocket, then you have to go look for some properly licensed free art. If you have a couple hundred bucks, yeah, you need to find the most beautiful thing for your game for a couple hundred bucks. Nice thing about these, is I take the file format I buy from them, I drag it into my game engine, and I immediately have uh, immediately a working animated character that I can export in the game immediately. Um, let's talk about marketing. I showed you the um, iTunes store here, and the very best marketing that happens with an iPhone app 
isn't how many banner ads you can get on what awesome blogs. That's all secondary to being able to be um, high up, and it'll load here in a sec. Over on the right. You have to be high up on these top 10 lists over on the right. Because like I said, that's where everyone looks and sees first. They look at the paid ones, and more people look down at the free ones immediately. So, and this is the Angry Birds app I was mentioning where they, they fly and knock stuff over with, with slingshot physics. So you have, to, uh, you have to get yourself as high up on these charts as possible. Um, does anybody who buys iPhone apps know how an app climbs the charts? I love this. I love the, the crickets in no hands because that means I'm imparting to you some new knowledge. Yes? You would think so, and customer ratings are important and they tie in, but the, that doesn't affect their popularity because the very top app could have like zero stars. It could be super crappy, but, uh, but be really high up. Yes? Sales? Yeah, it's all done on sales. They have, a secret, they have a secret equation that you can kind of reverse engineer and figure out, but it's weighted between the sales you've had maybe over the last week combined with a heavier weight looking at all the sales you had on the previous day. So what that means, and I'll tell you right now if you don't want to do the math in your head, what that means is for you to climb up the charts, you want to be able to have a bunch of sales concentrated on one day. You don't want to spread out three small sale peaks throughout uh, the week if you can get a whole bunch. If you could combine those onto one day, be three times as high and go further up the charts. Because once you break into the top 10, you're going to stay there cyclically. Once you drop down, it's easier to fall out of the top 25, the top 50, because those are different pages that people go with less and less frequency. The other thing is, the higher you get up on the charts, the higher your income is, your daily downloads are exponentially. So if you're in the first spot, you're, you're sell, like the first paid spot, you're selling like 30,000 a day. And after Apple's 70% cut, um, like even for 99 cents, you're making like more than $100,000 a week uh, and that's just you know just looking at it, but you got to that's just that's just sitting in the store. And then if you update it, you can you can get more sales peaks going so that you can ride the wave up here. I love these guys. This this game's called Angry Birds Rio HD. They had their other Angry Birds HD here. That's for iPad. But if we look at iPhone, I just want to show you some amazing marketing, so you can copy it verbatim. This is pretty awesome. So Angry Birds Rio is the top one. Then they have Angry Birds at number three, and it's fallen off the list, but this week they also had Angry Birds Holiday Edition up there. So they had three apps in the top 10, so they're easily raking in $100,000 a day. They've been up there for months, so you know they've broken the million dollar mark a few times, right? Um, yeah, question. Well, for example, you might have some connections with some tech blogs that are actually going to get you the kind of coverage you need. Because if you get a tech writer to write about you, that's infinitely better than just being a banner on their website. So if you make some connections with some tech blogs, which, uh, I don't know, I'll tell you how to do. I have some of their emails. But you have to, um, let's say you had three tech blogs you liked, you could easily slip them each uh, a different thing to cover in your a different exclusive on different days of the week because you thought oh I want people to be seeing this on Monday Wednesday and Friday but if you know how the math of the app store works you would give them all the information on the same day and tell them this is time sensitive you should release it now because it won't be exclusive tomorrow I'm putting on my web page and that way you try I mean they're still going to decide whether or not to even feature you but then you try to help funnel all of your coverage into one day um, and you just have to know how the the marketing end of things works to, to help that happen. Um, that's, a, that's a nice question. So, so polish. Something about polish, and it has to do with passion, is um, this, this game with these, these, uh, these angry birds and their slingshot physics, the, 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 the back story isn't very complicated. Some pigs stole the eggs out of the hen house, and now they're just, for some reason, hanging out in these rickety, tall structures that the birds hurdle themselves at to knock over. Um, 
and the birds look angry in the cutscenes. And when they're, they kind of got cute little faces while you're pulling back in the slingshot, and then they look all concentrated as they fly. And then when they hit, they look dazed or, or sad or whatever. Um, now, a similar game, and let's see if I can pull up a picture for reference so it's not all hypothetical. A similar game is, um, so there he is. You can kind of see he's all concentrating with his eyes closed. And he's just a ball that you're throwing at some cubes, you know, but really this is a lot of fun. Those boxes are all going to fall over and the birds are, the friends, the birds are going to fly out of their cages when they topple. Um, now picture if someone said, okay, this game's 99 cents. It looks beautiful. It's actually um, branded with art from, uh, oh, Esther, someone in the hall. Oh, the pizza's here. I'm like, oh, someone's coming. <laughs> I should have waved him off. He'd have some more time together, right? Um, now, what if, what if you made a game that was the exact same thing, but it was just a ball and a slingshot, and you let it go, and it knocked over some, like, less pretty crates? If those are both a buck, which one are you going to buy? It sounds rhetorical. Obviously, this one, it looks better. But why? Ask yourself, why would you buy that one? Why do you care? Like, let's say that the one with just the plain ball actually has a little bit better physics. They, it bounces a little more realistically. Um, why is this one more appealing? The graphics? That's easy to say, yeah, it just looks nice. Um, it does, and it looks nice to the point where you can tell they put so much polish in it and try to give it a little bit of um, some emotional tie so you care if the birds, you know, like, you don't care if the ball hits the crates, but you care if the birds free their friends. You, know, you care a little bit in your, like, in the dumb part of your heart, you know, you care a little bit there. Um, now, I want to talk to you about passion. I started my college, my college, uh, my college career as a, as a musician, all of my siblings did. Uh, we all were, were going down full-time uh, perf perf uh, performance majors. Um, I played the tuba, my brothers play the sax and the trumpet, and they have a band and they gig around New York City, they do really well. Um, and my sisters play violin and sing, but I was the only one who switched over to um, computer science and programming which you don't necessarily need to be an iPhone programmer because I got none of this in school. I, the principles in my programming classes applied, but I thought this was cool enough that I had to ask my wife permission. I was like, look, this is going to take a little more, bit more of my time after work and after school, but I really want to enter this Apple competition. They, they had iPod Touches back before anyone had one. And I was like, that's the only way we're ever going to afford one is if I win it at this competition. So. Um, Anyway, so I, I, I did my own app on the side, uh, and I've taught, I've been self-taught for everything I've done. Um, but my first app I did, it took me three weeks, because I had a game engine that I was familiar with. I knew where to get my art for cheap. My art cost a total of $10, because the game engine I showed you comes with a bunch of tutorials, and you can use any of the art from them. Oh, you, OK, you're going to like this story, because this is how I cleaned up, all right? Um, they come with these different tutorials that show you how to use it. And one of them is a spaceship flying around um, some pyramid levels, OK? That's kind of dumb. No one would fly. I mean, that's like Alien versus Predator, maybe. And everyone hated that movie, except those five nerds who knew about StarCraft, right? Me and you guys definitely liked AVP. And AVP, too. I don't, I don't think I even bothered. Um, so what happened was the art they had these levels, and I said, okay, I've got some of these levels that I can, people just would use pieces of, that I can use if it's in a game with this game engine. Those are licensed. Um, I have this thing that flies around these pyramids, because I didn't really know the math very well, uh, to do quaternion flight non-gimbal lock flying. I just didn't know how to do that back then, and I still don't. And so I thought, what can I make out of this? And all of the levels, the tutorials were like, uh, homes and office areas and that stuff. I was like, what flies around an office in a home? Uh, probably a, a toy airplane, right? But I didn't have a toy airplane. But a paper airplane made a lot of sense. And paper pilot sounded good. And I was at this company, and I love making games, but the company was just doing client work and business apps. And uh, I was just pulling my hair out. And uh, I was glad to have my first iPhone job. I landed it because I, I placed at that competition, the first one I entered, where I got the free iPod Touch my first instruction book. But I'm just pulling my hair out at work. And I'm like, I, you know, I thought this was going to be fun. 
So I tell my boss, you got to let me make a 3D game. That's where my experience has been. That's what I love to do. And he said, fine, I'll keep you on salary. I'll take the risk, take a week. It took me three weeks. But I said, OK, I've got offices, some flying mechanics. So I, we went and bought a paper airplane and a story for 10 bucks. I, I literally, I, didn't even, I couldn't even swap it out at the time for the, the flying machine. I just actually made it a sub-child and turned the flying machine's rendering off because I didn't even know how to swap them out yet. Um, and then I just got rid of the pyramid scene and put in the office scenes. I took the tutorials wholesale, which like all the other users, half of them thought that was just a terrible ripoff. But it was, it was allowed in the licensing and the CEO from you know, Copenhagen had my back and, and defended me on his blog or whatever. He's like, we make this engine to make things easier for people, so don't, don't make it all yourself. So I put those together, and now my eight paper airplanes flying around office buildings, and I just had to put in some paper clips that you have to catch in order to beat a level under a certain amount of time. All of that is pretty simple math to do, especially if you have a, a game engine to do it for you. We made it in three weeks, and then in the next three months, it made $100,000 on the App Store from just three weeks and $10 investment you know, in art. My, my boss had three weeks investment in me, and I, he was paying me 20 bucks an hour then, so, you know, 20 times 40, so less than $2,000 investment, and he got $100,000 back. Now he did some marketing that he didn't need to spend money on, but, um, but you gotta have enough passion. So this is why I'm not a music major, because if you're a music major, everyone tells you, um, they tell you, you know you're a great musician when you go to sleep thinking about music, and you wake up thinking about music, and that's all you can think about. Um, that's how I am with game development. That's not how I was with music. So I was like, okay, I'm never going to be a good musician. I just like playing my tuba uh, for fun sometimes. So, um, so I got into game development, and I am passionate about, about iPhone development. I just love it. It's a lot of fun for me, and I like the products that come out of it. Um, and you've got to have that, that passion that'll drive you through the hard parts because you're going to have a learning curve with any new, you know, with any new thing you're learning here at college um, and especially programming languages, you have to get up the learning curve before it actually feels rewarding and fun, before you feel like I'm just getting, I'm just hitting my head against the wall. But if you have a vision of what you want to go for, um, you remember James said that, I saw a friar in the hall, I think I can quote the Bible here, you remember uh, James said faith without works is dead and um, similarly going through the steps of a good app without the passion to really get it over the difficult parts um, is going to leave it empty and lifeless and your customers will know. Um, and I guess to wrap up here, I keep looking at this clock thinking, ah, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I know, it hasn't moved since I got here. I thought, oh, I'm only half an hour late. With traffic, I thought I was going to be later, you know? Um, but anyway, the last thing is you got to have some naysayers. you got to have people who play your app that you trust. For me, it's my brother, an old boss of mine, my wife, people of varying uh, technical abilities who can see who don't have the same passion. In fact, it's nice when they don't. Like my wife is like, ah, I like it when you do the things that bring in the regular paycheck. She's a really good naysayer. She supports me, loves me, lets me do what makes me happy. But um, thankfully, she can, uh, she can look very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It starts with an O. Objectively, thank you. Very objectively at what I'm doing. So you got to have people who tell you no, here are the holes you need to fix now. Because if you don't get it from them, you're going to get it from someone else on the App Store in your comments. And then you'll have lost the momentum of customers that if you'd have just waited, fix those because someone already told you. All those customers you would have still gotten at the beginning with good comments and snowballed into more sales. So, um, Man, that's my rundown of, to make an app, you gotta have fun, good execution, marketing, polish, passion, and get some naysayers on your side. It was just kind of a quick run through. This is a, this is a visual fiduciary marker. You can have any picture you want in here. This is from the string library. I have to mention that because they haven't launched it. I'm in a private beta and they said, don't do it unless. So we'll close with me showing you the thing I am most passionate about, which is um, augmented reality. That's where you take, thanks a lot. That's where you take uh, the real world in front of you. So I'm just placing this marker on this table. And then you mix it with um, a CGI image that you produce. All right, so this is the string library I'm using. And look, there's everybody, right? Because my iPad has a camera. OK. But now I'm going to look down at the table. And you can see this marker on the table. It's going to recognize it and overlay my 3D scene. And I'm just working on something here. And you know, it's, it's fully 3D, so we can move around it and stuff. You gotta keep the marker on the screen though. But then I have some input here 
So my little, my little guy, oh, I think I knocked him off the screen. He's gone. Well, I have some inputs for my B. I can't see where he went. But anyway, I can walk all around this, right? And uh, actually interact in 3D with it however I want. Um, just so you guys know, like, I know this engine pretty well, and I know augmented reality because I've been involved with it. I got this, um, I got this, uh, this, is a, this is a closed beta product that's going to release soon. Um, but I drag and drop the framework into the free game engine. Um, and the framework's free too, because you don't have to pay for it until you're going to deploy something for commercial launch. And then they immediately had a tutorial that already had something showing, a little red box, immediately. And I just switched out the box for a game level that I had made for a different project. These are actually going to come forward along the ground. You can see the ground's moving. But these are going to come forward along the ground and it's just going to be like a Space Invaders in augmented reality. Um, but anyway, I mean, just so you guys know, you've got to find the right tools because they make it insanely simple to do this yourself. And they help you to kind of get over the rough spots when you have something um, that fun to work on. Yeah, so the Nintendo DS, they've written their own because you can write your own from scratch. Um, I can't write my own from scratch for the same price that I can license it from them. However, I checked, if you look at the Nintendo 3DS demos, they do some things like ground deformation and uh, other things where you've got to know your competitors. I immediately saw them. I don't have it here to show you, but I can take this ground plane. You see this, this green binary coming down here? I can replace that with the image of the table that I pick up off the camera, and then I can deform that 3D mesh so it looks like I'm messing with the table. It can ripple and wave like water. The 3DS does that. Um, and if you, are, if you pay attention in your abstract linear algebra class, where you do a little bit of vector math, or, uh, or just in geometry, um, you could look at that 3DS and say, I know how they did that, I'm going to make that. That's actually what I'm working on for a, a contest submission I'm doing this week. So it's similar. Yeah, of course you can. You need to use a program like Maya or 3D Studio Max. Those are both expensive. Maya's, I mean, it's a thousand bucks. It used to be ten thousand, so relatively inexpensive. Um, but that's what Pixar uses to make its movies. 3D Studio Max is what game studios make, high-end ones to make their games. Um, but if those are too expensive for you, like they are for me, um, you can get to know Blender, which is very difficult to use, but it's also free. I mean, the, it's, it's great. It does everything, but the user interface is very tricky to learn. Um, but if you went to blender.org, you could get some experience with that. Um, but there are other tools like Milkshape. Milkshape is nice. I think you can do some modeling in there. The nice thing is if you have the game engine, like that free one, it comes with uh, some primitive shapes that you can combine to make your prototypes until you have the, the nicer ones you want. So you might check out Blender. You might also check out friends of yours who already know how to do this and get it from them, like go on a little... Uh, go in 50-50 or something. Because, I don't know. I don't know what the, the design department's like at the college. Is there any 3D modeling? No, there isn't. But, so you need to go talk to your friends in the other colleges. I don't know. That doesn't sound embarrassing. Um, but anyway, that's what I have to do. I have to go talk to friends at college uh, about it. Friends always good. Yeah, and they don't know what they're worth if they're in college. They think it's okay to pay them 20 bucks an hour, 12 bucks an hour, zero if they're your friend, you know? Yeah, you end up putting bones in. This is why you need someone who knows what they're doing. They, uh, they fit it with a skeleton that you then define the animation around, and then they actually paint deformation weights around the joints and stuff so that when this joint moves, because like when I move my arm, I don't know if you've ever thought of this, this, this action in depth before, but there's a movement your arm does when you twist like this. I'm obviously twisting my wrist, not my elbow. But my skin all the way back here twists. My wrist twists completely with the movement, but it decreases as you get back to here. And my elbow actually stretches my skin up here a tiny bit, but in a less noticeable fashion. You have to paint deformation weights onto the, 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 onto the model, onto the 3D vertices, so that each, each uh, pivot, each bone joint moves all the other vertices to a certain amount. So like when this bone moves, it would have no interaction with the left half of my body or off of my arm even. Mm -hmm. Right. The nice thing is if you, if you, if you dished out the 191 bucks for those mechs, that, that, all that's done, you know.
for less than you could ever pay an artist to do it. They can they sell them cheap because they you know they they sell them to everyone. They sell them in bulk. Uh, 